Um, so what I was going to do today was just spend a few minutes um, sketching out, as I have you know, five minute sketch, right? Uh, a research project that I'm doing jointly with Carolyn Fisher um, at RFF on efficiency versus equity in energy regulation. Um, and the starting point for this is recognizing that frequently when economists think about uh, market-based policies like cap and trade or carbon taxes, um, they tend to focus on the economic efficiency of these policies. So um, that is, if you put a price on CO2 with a carbon tax, that price percolates throughout the economy. Everybody faces it and everybody can make the right decision about where to mitigate their CO2 emissions. And the result is, you know, in the economist's idealized vision of the world, that only the cheapest reductions take place, only the ones that are lower than the carbon price. Um, and as a result, as a society, we achieve the cheapest possible reductions uh, from that policy. You know, meanwhile, if you think about the alternative, such as fuel economy regulations for automobiles and the clean power plan and the power sector and efficiency standards everywhere else, um, you recognize that there are at least two ways that those can create much higher costs for society. One is that uh, you could have very high costs in one sector while there are very cheap opportunities somewhere else. Um, and even within a sector, if you think about the clean power plant, it may not be the cheapest way to reduce emissions in that sector. Um, so while economists think about uh, these sorts of wondrous features of the market-based policies, um, they frequently kind of uh, uh, skim over the fact that these market-based policies create much larger redistributions than their regulatory alternatives. So what do I mean by that? So if you imagine a uh, market-based policy, a carbon tax that reduces emissions by, say, 20%, you might estimate that that policy would cost, let's just say, $10 billion. Yeah, three minutes. Uh, $10 billion. That's $10 billion for more expensive power plants and more expensive cars and more expensive buildings that all deliver the same services, um, but they're more expensive because they don't have the carbon emissions associated with them. Now, a regulatory approach might have much higher costs, say $20 billion to get those same reductions. But the important thing to think about is that that carbon price, that carbon tax or that tradable permit system is also going to create $100 billion, say, in allowance value or tax revenue. And this allowance value or tax revenue is costs for somebody uh, it's benefits for somebody else, whoever gets all that money, but it's cost for somebody, and that cost is frequently many, many times the actual societal cost. Now, economists frequently like to skip over that because that's just redistribution. Somebody's paying, but somebody's getting it. But if you think about that for a second, you know, that, that redistribution could be a really important thing to think about. Now, in welfare economics, we frequently focus just on the inco income outcomes. That is, how much, what's the distribution of income across society before the policy, what's the, the distribution afterwards? And if you use that lens to think about these sorts of things, you could say, well, you know, the income distribution is roughly the same. There are a bunch of people who were poor before, and now they're rich. There are some rich people who are now poor. The income distribution doesn't change. Um, but you may actually think to yourself, this whole process of, of redistributing wealth has a, has a welfare cost associated with it. So in this research, what we're trying to do is two things. One is to try to think about how do you present information to stakeholders and policymakers about the redistributions that are taking place? What are some visuals or some summary statistics that can try to get at this um, in a much more comprehensive way, not just thinking about the income deciles, but within income deciles or across different regions of the country? Um, how can you project information about what the distributional impacts are? And second of all, what sorts of welfare measures would capture the idea that this redistribution has a societal cost associated with it. So there's lots of, lots of literature on welfare measures, very small literature on things called horizontal equity measures, which basically try to capture the idea that if, we're, if Lori and I are basically the same income level, but we have vastly different impacts from a policy, that something seems weird about that. Even if the total distribution doesn't change very much, if we're the same, we ought to see uh, relatively similar impacts. And if we don't, that is a cost associated with it. Um, there's also another small literature on wealth, relative effects that looks at whether or not it's the change in income that actually uh, makes people irritated. Now, I think from a political point of view, that's pretty much true. You know that the changes are what actually matters. Uh, but we're going to try to look into uh, welfare measures that may try to capture this notion in a more formal framework. So anyway, so that's the sketch. Uh, the research is not quite done yet, as my talk perhaps suggested. Um, but I can talk to anybody who's interested later on.
Uh, hi, my name is Brian Bollinger. I'm in the marketing department over at the Fuqua School of Business. This is work with Wes Hartman, and I thought I'd take a break from solar to talk about uh, welfare effects of home automation technologies. Think Nest thermostats. Uh, the motivation was, can we better enable consumers to respond to changing market conditions? If we're going to use time of use pricing, I don't want to drive home right now, change my thermostat because it's a high price day. I want something to do that automatically for me, and something like a programmable thermostat can do that. So what's the welfare effects if we do that? Uh, the application is an electricity demand. It's something that's highly regulated. And uh, you think real-time pricing would be ideal if we could re reduce those costs of consumers adjusting their thermostats. The second part of the paper, after we calculate welfare effects, is going to look at household level treatment effects. Can we actually target this technology to households who would actually use the technology in that way? And uh, will this increase uh, firm or consumer welfare? So two steps of the paper. First, we're going to non-parametrically estimate consumer welfare effects of the technology, compare that to the firm surplus of reducing peak demand during critical demand periods. And then we're going to have this innovative household matching procedure to get household level treatment effects to be used in the targeting of that technology. These are the technologies we look at in in-home display, which just tells you your consumption uh, usage and your price at any period of time. We also have a programmable thermostat, which isn't as nice looking as a Nest. You can see this very explicit trade-off between savings and comfort, which is the opposite of what Nest wants to do, uh, which they told me when I was presenting this work there. But here it's very clear, savings or comfort. <laughs> if it's high on savings on a high price day, your uh, thermostat's going to shut off your AC automatically for you. On a low price day, it's going to allow that AC to keep running. So. Uh, in addition to those two technologies, we actually have different types of pricing treatments. There's a time of use pricing treatment, which is four cents in off-peak hours, 23 cents in peak hours. This is two to seven p.m. during the weekday. And then variable peak pricing, where you have multiple price levels, which reflect aggregate demand, total demand, which would include the commercial side as well. And here the price levels are four and a half cents, 11 cents, 23 cents, and 46 cents. Uh, and then the control group pricing faces a flat pricing, and this is what customers historically face. If they're on the residential side, it's just a flat price at all times, regardless of the supply conditions. Here, again, is looking at these treatments. We have portal, in-home display, programmable thermostat, and a combination of all three interacted with the two different pricing conditions, time of use pricing versus variable peak pricing, and then we have the people in our control group as well. Uh, you can see that there's a clear effect over the course of an average day of these technologies. All technologies lead to this reduction relative to the control consumption and the home uh, the programmable thermostat and the combination of all three leads to this really sharp reduction at 2 p.m. when everyone's air conditioning units are shut off from their home thermostats. Uh, and then you see this actually this, this increase after 7 p.m. as you have to now cool the house down to a more comfortable temperature. So clear effect of these treatments. Uh, I'm going to skip the treatment effect. Essentially, programmable thermostats lead to about a one kilowatt reduction uh, uh, in that uh, energy consumption. In terms of getting welfare, what we want to do is actually trace out the demand curve. And anyone who has tried to estimate electricity uh, pr demand response, price elasticity knows it's incredibly hard because when it's a hot day or high demand day, that's what actually leads to higher prices. So you sort of get this absurd increasing demand curve. What we can do with the control group is can condition on the people who face a flat price. And you're essentially conditioning on any unobserved factor that leads to high demand. So this is when control group has a very low usage. This is when the control group has a very high usage. And this is comparing demand curves when you don't have the programmable thermostat. It's completely vertical, inelastic demand, versus when you have a programmable thermostat. And now we see what looks like a natural demand curve. Just tracing out basic areas under these demand curves can actually give you the consumer welfare effect of a programmable thermostat. And if you do that calculation, it's a whole $28 uh, per summer, or $280 NPV with a 90% discount rate. You compare that to the firm side, the firm estimated their NPV of a kilowatt hour per hour reduction to be $700 in the critical demand periods because it's so costly for them to start up the new generating capacity. So this means it's the firms who are probably going to be the ones who are installing this. The thermostat costs $250. So it's really a wash for consumers. We know from the energy efficiency literature that they're not going to adopt this since it's a wash in terms of their welfare. Uh, so the second part of the paper, again, the household level treatment effects with this matching. Essentially, the idea is if Rick's usage and my usage is a function of states like weather and our past usage are similar, we are similar households, we can get household level treatment effects. This is plotting the treatment effects now as distributions. These are CDFs. 
Uh, these are the uh, portal, the in-home display. Now you can see a much bigger effect of the programmable thermostat. And there's considerable heterogeneity in the effect which can't be explained by demographics. So really what we want to do is use this rich history of electricity consumption as a way to do the matching procedure. Uh, and then if you actually look at who you should give the thermostats to, anything uh, above, no, below the line is someone you want to give the thermostats to. And if you actually target it to people who would use it, you have a 30% increase in firm surplus by using this targeted approach. So that's it. Thank you. Uh, hey, uh, thanks. I, uh, Martin Ross, I'm also an economist. Uh, what I do is uh, sort of build models to do policy analysis, try to figure out um, you know, what, what is the carbon tax going to do to GDP or household income or whatever else the case may be. So I was just going to walk you through very briefly a couple of those model structures and uh, some of the stuff that we have been working on to see where it might overlap with you all. Um, didn't check my animation. Um, so there's uh, this DM model. Uh, there's sort of two, uh, two components. There's a uh, macroeconomic side, which is uh, a general equilibrium model um, of like the entire economy, both sort of globally and uh, regions within the US. And that's really sort of a, a you know, application of economic theory to you know, data we pull from w the real world and it's got a, a fairly strong energy uh, and greenhouse gas focus. And um, you know, it basically we use it to, uh, you know, one of the things we've been doing with it is uh, this, the Stanford Energy Modeling Forum. It's a group that gets together a bunch of uh, energy modelers and takes a look at, the, at various policies, you know, sort of you know, across the range of models, how different are the responses you get looking at the same policy with the same assumptions to try to get a feel for how the models are behaving. So at the moment, what we're taking a look at with that process is, you know, the carbon taxes, like Billy mentioned, uh, you know, some revenue recycling options, you know, you, you put on these carbon taxes, you've got all this money, what do you do with it? And what are the income distribution impacts of, uh, you, know, you know, sending that money around the economy? We've also did some work on natural gas markets and uh, we're probably going to move into a more on the global side, uh, taking a look at you know, some of the Paris agreements and possibly uh, you know, the economic effects of uh, climate change itself. And this is just a diagram of the model structure. I'll skip over that. Uh, so these were some uh, results on the carbon tax side. So you put on a carbon tax of 25 bucks a ton. You have some measure of household consumption, household welfare, how much better off are they. And this just takes a look at, for the different regions of the country, um, you know, what is the, the loss in welfare consumption because of this carbon tax? And this particular is, example is, uh, you know, take, collecting this money and then using it to lower uh, labor taxes, which, you know, the idea is, uh, you know, you raise, uh, raise a carbon tax and you send the money out into the economy and try to reduce tax distortion somewhere else and you can buy some political support maybe by, you know, making people less unhappy than they would have been in this well, color coding just sort of shows across the uh, different household income groups. Uh, green is sort of less costly, red is more costly. Uh, I guess the you know, main takeaway from that is that uh, you know, the, the East Coast and the West Coast are better off than the middle part of the country, which uh, matches up fairly well with the uh, perhaps political support for uh, carbon taxes in some sense. Uh, we also do a bunch of electricity dispatch modeling, uh, similar to what Dolly was talking about, but with a more of a, a long-term focus. Uh, we do a lot of work with uh, states to look at the clean power plan and uh, you know, try to advise the states on what sort of choices they could make to try to you know, meet policy goals, reduce carbon emissions in the most cost-effective way. And it's a fairly detailed model with you know, millions of equations, and it can be linked to the macroeconomic side of the uh, model. Um, so electricity sector emissions in the U.S. I just wanted to walk through this. Uh, so the clean power plant is trying to reduce emissions. You know, you've got some baseline level of emissions, uh, baseline level of emissions with uh, energy efficiency measures. Uh, you know, what happens if, you know, gas if gas prices are really low, then you uh, get a lot less emissions in the baseline even without the policy. Um, this is one way of instituting the policy as an emissions rate target, and uh, you can see that, uh, you know, in some cases it gets you below the baseline with low gas price. In some cases it doesn't. Uh, you can also do the policy through a mass cap on emissions. 
Uh, that's a cap on existing units. Uh, this is a cap including the new units, so you've got a, a more reduction, a percentage reduction. The model will give you uh, this notion of uh, percentage changes in sort of system costs by state. Uh, you know, use some caution when you interpret those, but just as a general sense of what uh, the model gives you, you know, these are sort of state level policies. And uh, then, just for curiosity, I ran the uh, you know these policies reduce criteria pollutants. So I ran the uh, changes in uh, SO2 and NOx through this uh, EPA sort of COBRA screening tool that gives you health benefits. And this uh, you know little color coded map shows you where the benefits are. And you know you've got benefits of 20 to 40 billion dollars a year in total costs for the policy of uh, about 12 billion dollars over time. Thank you.